Um, today's class is going to be taught to you by Allison O'Connor. Um, she is the horticulture agent in Larimer County doing all kinds of amazing things. And I know bulbs are one of her favorite things to talk about. And um, so I will just go ahead and turn it right over to Allison so that we can get started. Thank you, Amy. Thanks everybody for joining us. So happy to be here. And I feel like the days finally feel a little fallish. We're getting a little bit cooler weather. Uh, depending on where you are, you might be getting your first freeze tonight. But we are talking bulbs and there still is time to get these beauties in the ground before the end of the season. So we'll just start right into it. There's a lot to cover. And again, if you have questions, throw them into the chat and Amy will answer them or I'll get to them at the end of the session. So let's start. So I do have to give a plug for Extension because both Amy and I work for Extension and it's really where university meets community. We are the outreach arm of Colorado State University, which is your land grant institution here in Colorado. And what we do is we take all of that wonderful research that's happening on campus and we bring it back to you in a way that you can use in your everyday life. So both Amy and I work in the area of horticulture. We coordinate the Master Gardener program and we're doing all things horticulture. And I know many of you have experienced extension and have been with us in the past and just know that we are here for you in your needs and whatever you need in your everyday life. So you can check out the extension website, tons of information on there, feel free. And then also reach out to your local county office. Today we're going to discuss the following is why plant bulbs. We'll then go a little bit into bulb biology, just a little bit so that you're a little bit more informed about what you're actually putting in the ground. And then we'll um, cover care, culture, the chilling period, talking about purchasing bulbs because that's something that you'll need to do if you don't already have some in your garage. And then we'll actually follow the presentation and the presentation with different types of bulbs that you can plant into your gardens. And so I do want to make a note that we're talking about spring blooming bulbs. I may call them fall planted bulbs. The terms are identical, but essentially these are the bulbs that we're planting now that we will then see in spring. Okay, so these are the ones, your tulips, your hyacinths, your daffodils, those are spring blooming bulbs. I did a talk earlier this year on summer blooming bulbs, which are cannas and dahlias. That's a totally different talk, totally different type of plant. And so uh, just know that these are the ones that are going to bloom right after winter. The reasons to plant bulbs are numerous. And for me personally, I just absolutely love seeing them poke their little heads out of the soil to me, it's a sign that winter is ending, even though in Colorado, we know that winter can be Mother's Day, uh, but we do know that the days are starting to lengthen, the temperatures are starting to warm, and bulbs are really one of the first signs of spring. And so what's great about these plants is that it gets a little bit dreary in those December, January months, but some of these bulbs like snowflakes, which is pictured are snowdrops, they can actually start to bloom as early as February. And for us as gardeners, I think it gets us excited. It makes us energized for a new season. And really on the whole, bulbs are one of the most easy, versatile plants that you can incorporate into your garden. And I will say, I just talked to my dad this week. He's in Minnesota, just north of the Twin Cities. And for the first time he planted some bulbs. And so I'm so excited to see what will come out of his zone three garden because he's even a little bit colder than we are. So really bulbs are a great way to add color to your otherwise bleak spring landscape. With the taxonomy, a bulb is a kind of a general term, uh, but a true bulb is actually has these bulb-like structures and essentially it's an underground storage organ. So think of your onions. An onion is a type of bulb and there are layers involved in true bulbs. And so I have some more information. Essentially, this is what the bulb biology looks like is that you have a tunic, which is the outer papery coating. You have some scales, which would be similar to your layers of an onion. And the bulb is really self-contained. So there's some roots at the bottom and then the bulb itself contains everything it needs in order to bloom for that season. So it's not unsimilar to a seed, which of course has everything 
that plant needs to grow and bloom and fruit, the bulb is a self-contained unit. And so really they're amazing that we can put this thing that looks almost dormant or looks very blah, we put it into the ground and then the next spring we can have these beautiful flowers. Examples of true bulbs include tulips, alliums, which I will talk about because I am absolutely obsessed with alliums. They are in the onion family and they are spectacular. Uh, hyacinths are true bulbs, daffodils, and also squill. So these are true bulbs. Here's an example. On the left are some allium bulbs. On the right are some tulips. And so these are just familiar terms to you. But we generally just call all of these plants bulbs, even though botanically they are different. Another type of bulb that we'll run into, especially with fall planted bulbs, are the corms. And the corms are basically swollen and large stem bases. Um, and examples of these are anemones, gladiola, so that's one of our summer blooming friends, but those are actually corms. And probably the most popular corm that we run into in the fall are the crocus, which is what's pictured there. And crocus are one of those cheerful little purple, yellow, white, flowers that are just adorable. We call them a minor bulb because they tend to be a little bit smaller in nature. They're not as showy as maybe a daffodil or some of the alliums, um, but crocus are a corm. So these are just under, under enlarged stems. So this is an example of a crocus corm. There is a top and a bottom, just like there is with any true bulb. And sometimes it is hard to tell. So I completely understand that if you're a little bit confused, you get these, again, little brown nuggets. You're not exactly sure how to plant them. It should be fairly clear. You should maybe see some roots or an indication on the bottom. But again, if you're not sure, you're going to plant it on its side and the bulb will actually figure out which way is up. So that's a good thing. But in terms of corms, these are the crocus. They'll have a little bit of a point, almost like a beak, and that would be the top of the bulb, and then the bottom would have some roots. And tubers are another type of bulb. Tubers are our friends, the potatoes, our sweet potatoes, regular potatoes. And these are thickened rhizomes or stolons. So again, modified roots. Um, basically in large storage organs. And for the most part, we don't plant tubers in the fall. These are more for our summer blooming plants. Um, obviously we eat a lot of tubers in our life. And for the most part, tubers are plants that are not going to be hardy. So if you have any summer blooming plants that you grew in your garden, uh, like tuberous begonias or dahlias, those are plants that if you want to save them year to year that you'll have to dig up because they are not winter hardy. That is different than our fall planted bulbs, which is what we're focusing on today, is that they will survive year to year without having to be dug up at any point. So that is a good point to make. Moving into planting bulbs, September and October are really the best months. Uh, really, you want those bulbs to get well rooted before the ground freezes. And really, for the most part in the front range, we have had a wonderful, long, leisurely fall. Uh, I could argue that we could have used a little bit more precipitation, uh, but for the most part, we've had really warm days and our soils are still very warm. So even though the outdoor temperature or our nights are getting into freezing temperatures or into the 30s, the soil, because it's part of Earth's mass, is still very, very warm. And so even planting now through the end of the month in the front range locations, that will give you enough time to get some roots established. These are not big plants. They're, again, maybe a couple inches big. Uh, so that will give them time to get those roots established. I saw in the chat that if you do plant a lip, can you plant too early? You know, I would say it's better to wait until you start to notice some of those changes in the fall weather, um, it, especially if they're in a well irrigated site, because sometimes planting too early might lead to overwatering. Um, but again, a lot of times our garden centers won't actually have bulbs available until we get into some of those shorter days. So end of August, uh, is probably fine, but really September, October are I, the ideal months. Your bulbs for the most part will grow best in full sun to part shade. And you, this is where you can utilize places in your landscape like below shade trees where maybe it's too shady to plant some of our 
sun loving plants during the summer months, but bulbs are going to come up, they're going to bloom, and they're going to be on their way out before the trees fully leaf out. The flowers will last longer if they're not in direct afternoon sun. So a west facing landscape for some of our bulbs might provide too much intense sunlight. And it's not that they won't bloom, it's just that the flowers may not last quite as long and you might get a little bit quicker of a life cycle. Um, so just keep that in mind. So maybe an east facing um, or you know west facing is just fine. Just understand that you may not get the longevity of the flowers themselves. And then again, utilize those spaces under your deciduous trees, especially for plants like your squill and crocus and some of your minor bulbs. They will love that early season um, sun that the deciduous tree provides before the tree fully leaves out. So this is just an amazing shot. This is somewhere I think in Europe. Um, obviously, if you replicate this in Colorado, please let me know because Amy and I will come and visit you. Uh, but this is absolutely amazing. The river is grape hyacinth. And then of course we have some tulip daffodils. So this would take thousands of bulbs and thousands of hours of planting time. Uh, but the effect is absolutely incredible. So you can do really wonderful things or you can do something that's a little bit more Colorado. These are species tulips and species tulips are not quite as refined as some of the Dutch tulips that we might be used to. But again, we have some grape hyacinth here, some mustari, and then our species tulips. So species tulips do really well. They tend to be a lot more drought tolerant. Um, they may not give you the color or maybe the selection that you want, uh, but they are great plants. And they tend to be more reliable in flowering than some of the Dutch tulips, but we'll get into that. So this is a great example of how you can incorporate bulbs into your Colorado garden. And really just tucking them here and there is going to be a great use of space, especially if you have perennials that may be die out or you have gaps right now, you could throw some bulbs in there for some color in the spring. Moving on to drainage and soil, it's essential. So drainage is number one, you must have well-drained soil. For the most part, these plants are going to do well where your perennials are already established or maybe where you have trees and shrubs. If you are in a new landscape or you haven't worked the soils too much, if you can incorporate organic matter into your soils, the recommendation is 12, 10 to 12 inches deep, which is a chore. Um, and even the best tiller is not going to go much deeper than six or eight inches. Uh, so do what you can, but drainage is essential. If you've noticed that you have areas after it rains or after you irrigate of low spots that are just kind of soggy, I would avoid planting bulbs in those spots. You can also utilize your raised beds. And so if you have harvested all of your vegetables at this point, you could put bulbs in your raised beds. And we'll talk about some of the tips in making sure that those bulbs bloom year to year. But it might be something where if you get a discount or a deal on some bulbs at a garden center or a box store, it could give you some nice spring color, understanding that you might treat them as annuals. So you plant them this fall, they bloom in the spring. And then when you're ready to plant your raised beds next summer with your tomatoes and your eggplant, then you could just remove those bulbs. It's an option. There's lots of options. And most bulbs are going to do fine in our pH that we're given. They would prefer a little bit lower pH, but they do just fine with what we have. With fertilizer, if you are treating bulbs as any annuals, and this is actually a really common thing, so don't think that um, it's kind of a, a weird thing, but there's a lot of people that actually treat bulbs as an annual and they just replant every year. So if you are just treating your bulbs as an annual, you don't need to fertilize. Those bulbs have everything they need in order to bloom that season. If you have bulbs that you plan to really um, create more of a naturalized space, or um, an area that you want to really be permanently in daffodils, you could add a slow release complete fertilizer to the root area at planting. Uh, so what this means is that when you plant, you could then add your fertilizer according to the fertilizer label. You can use whatever you want. You can use fish emulsion, you can use um, Scott's, you can use miracle Grow, whatever you want. It, your fertilizer really doesn't matter. I would encourage you to use something that we consider to be a complete fertilizer 
which means that it really does have the three numbers on the label of equal, um, of equal number. Now there are bulb specialty fertilizers and you can use those too. Absolutely, that's not a problem. Um, you could also use bone meal. That would be fine. Um, it's been found that bone meal might be a deterrent for some of our digging animals. Uh, but again, whatever you use, make sure that you're using it according to the label and applying it as directed. Don't use more, not recommended. Bulb booster, so these are more of the specialty bulb fertilizers. Research has shown that they're really only moderately effective. So generally these fertilizers have a higher phosphorus number, which is the second number in the label. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So it'd be the middle number and usually it's a higher amount and research done in Alabama, which of course you can argue that they have different soils and different climates, uh, but really research done showed that it was really not super beneficial. So you could spend the extra money and get bulb fertilizer, or you just use whatever you have. Um, and really what Alabama found is that having bulb fertilizer or fertilizer that's lower in phosphorus actually was more beneficial. And here's the fact about our soils. So for the most part, our Colorado soils have gobs of phosphorus available, lots and lots of phosphorus. It is never a nutrient that we really need to add. So when people become upset or worried that, you know, we have phosphorus free fertilizers, not a concern because in our native soils, there's plenty of phosphorus available to support plant growth. So if you can't find a fertilizer with phosphorus, no big deal. So again, fertilizer is one of those things that you really need to consider. I, for one, this is me personally, Allison speaking, I've never fertilized my bulbs. They're very reliable. I am a lean gardener. I don't put in a lot of extra effort into my landscape. Uh, and I have found my bulbs to do extremely well. So again, using what my soils have provided, I do put wood mulch over the top, which adds some nutrients and organic matter. But for the most part, I think we might rely a little bit too much on fertilizer and we need to focus more on the cultural practices and things like that. One final thing about fertilizer is that I would avoid any of our fertilizers that have a high nitrogen number because you'll get a ton of leafy growth but probably very few blooms. So hopefully, Amy, that didn't cause too much consternation in the chat. Is there anything at this point I need to address? Um, I don't think so. I think I've been answering most of the questions. Um, although I'm, I'm replying back to Mark now, but um, he had a question about fertilizing on top of the bulb so that the nutrients wash down into the root area. Yeah, I'm not you sure could that makes much of a difference, but I don't think it does make a difference, Mark. Um, thanks, Amy. Uh, I think for the most part, if you do that, so really at this point, you, you would want to place the fertilizer where it's going to be used. So when you put the bulbs in the ground, you're trying to encourage the root growth um, because the tops of course are not growing at that point. So that's why the idea is to put the fertilizer in the hole when you actually plant them. Um, if you put them at the top, they will benefit from it eventually. It just not may not be during the establishment process. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so moving into our planting bulbs, this is actually taking the bulb and getting it into the ground. These are just some general tips. And I would encourage you to utilize some other resources to make sure that you know how deep you need to plant things. The general rule of thumb is to measure the height of the bulb and then multiply that by three. And that will give you your depth that you're going to plant. Or the other thing is, is to look at a plant tag and really decide, it should say on the plant tag of how deep you need to plant those. Uh, but for the most part, measure the height of the bulb multiplied by three, that is the bottom of your planting hole. You do want to plant with the growing tip up uh, with tulips, with corms. Um, usually it's pretty easy to see, but there are some unusual bulbs that may not look like you can really figure out the top from the bottom. And if that's the case, again, put it on its side the bulb will find its way up. That's called geotropism. It's a pretty cool thing with the plant. You do need to space your bulbs appropriately. So the larger ones are going to be spaced further apart, maybe four to eight inches apart. With the smaller ones like your crocus, your squill, they might be one to three inches apart. And I would always recommend that you plant and mass for the most dramatic effect. 
So instead of taking 10 tulips and planting them here and there throughout your garden, where you just get then one tulip showing, you might plant five tulips together in one spot and five together in another. Then when they bloom, you have a much more dramatic show and a great pop of color. The end mass thing is especially important for some of the smaller bulbs or the minor bulbs, because if you're planting one snowdrop, not going to really see one snowdrop. But if you plant a hundred snowdrop, that is going to make more of a visual impact. But again, it depends on the kind of gardener that you are. One daffodil is going to be a lot more showy than maybe one hyacinth. So just keep that in mind. There are bulb planting charts available. You can just Google your favorite Holland bulb planting chart. And this is just to give you an idea of how deep some of these bulbs need to be planted. Now I just planted some tulips over the weekend and my soils are rock hard because I haven't been irrigating them very well. Uh, so if you do plan to plant, if you can somehow hydrate those soils to make it easier on yourself to uh, get them in the ground, that's going to be ideal. Or if you can only pickaxe a couple inches down, then maybe stick to some of the smaller bulbs because if you buy any of those like giant alliums, you're looking at a planting depth of eight inches, maybe even a little bit more. That's a pretty deep hole. Um, it doesn't need to be wide, but it does need to be that deep. So keep that in mind. And I do have a couple more things. So when you buy your bulbs, you can also look at the tag and it will tell you how deep you need to plant things and how also how wide they need to be spaced out. So we have Four inches deep, this is a fritillaria. We'll talk about fritillaria. It's a wonderful bulb that I think everybody should incorporate. So this one is four inches deep. Uh, then we're going to keep them about six inches apart. So that tells you that this is going to be a little bit of a wider plant, or at least the flowers are going to be a little bit wider. And then it also, the tag will tell you the flowering time. So bulbs are usually categorized by early, mid, or late spring. So early spring are going to be those that come up maybe even in February, March. Mid is going to be March to April, and then late is going to be April to May. And there are some alliums that bloom well into late May and into early June, which is really nice. So you can get a long blooming period if you are clever and creative about buying your bulbs. And even tulips or daffodils will have a bloom period. So not all of them will be mid-season. There might be some early and there might be some late. So if you love daffodils, you can buy the right varieties and have a you know several week long blooming period, which is really great. This was a blog that I posted and I was planting some bulbs. I went a little crazy a couple of years ago and decided that planting a couple hundred bulbs would be a fun fall activity. It was a lot of work, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but I also thought that it was helpful to show you kind of the difference of the depth of how you need to plant these. So that's just a ruler, a 12 inch ruler, and then tulip, daffodil, hyacinth, and crocus. And you can see the depth that you need to plant those at. So just again, keep that in mind, the bigger the bulb in general, the deeper it needs to be planted. So after the ground freezes, and this is when the ground freezes solid in the front range, that might be somewhere around mid-November to late November, just depends on the season. You can then cover your bulbs with three inches of mulch. And it could be wood mulch, it could be leaves, it could be grass clippings if you still have them, whatever you have around. Uh, for the most part, I have just used wood mulch because I'm planting them in beds where I already have wood mulch in there. Um, what the mulch does, it's just like what it does for the rest of our plants. It helps with freezing and thawing. Um, so it kind of keeps the bulbs a little bit more protected. If we get any moisture or when you're watering following establishment, it will also help keep the soil more moist. You can leave the mulch in April. Uh, I have found for the most part that the bulbs, even the teeny tiny guys, come right up through it. Uh, but if it's thick of a layer or you notice that your foliage isn't making its way through, you can scrape that off. Uh, but for the most part, these are tough plants. It is amazing of how pernicious they are to get through the soil, to get through your mulch layer, and then still have this wonderful bloom. 
For in terms of watering, I would say normal fall and winter precipitation is enough. Uh, because we are in a very, very dry period, you will need to supplementally water, at least first after you plant. Uh, but for the most part, bulbs are extremely drought tolerant, especially since they come up so early, they benefit from the moisture that we do get during the winter months and then during the spring. That tends to be at least recently of when we get our most amount of moisture is during those spring months. Um, during the summer, if they get some supplemental moisture, that's a great thing. That's not a bad thing at all. And then you will want to water as soon as you plant them uh, to help them get established. The chilling period is very important and this is where it kind of determines when you need to get them into the ground. So most of the bulbs will require 12 to 16 weeks of a chilling period to produce flowers. And a chilling period is usually at a set temperature and it will depend on the bulb as to what that temperature is. So just think that these bulbs for the most part are need, going to need a chilling period of three to four months. That's why we try to get them in the ground by the end of October so that they have those three to four months of the colder soil temperatures in order to really initiate growth. If your bulbs are not chilled long enough, or let's say that you go out of town for the next month, you come home and it's nice around Thanksgiving and you decide to plant your bulbs then, you'll probably still get blooms, but the flowers will be really squatty and really short. Um, I've seen this quite a bit with hyacinths and it could just be the hyacinths, but it could also be uh, the chilling period that is required. So you still get a beautiful flower. Um, the next year, the plants should regulate themselves and it should be just fine. But just know that if you're pushing it and they don't have that chilling period, it can affect how the flowers bloom uh, the following year. A couple slides on potential problems. So again, if you have two wet soils, uh, you do need to amend that or avoid planting bulbs in that area. So do what you can. Um, planting at the bottom of a downspout, probably not the best idea. Um, also understand that bulbs are loved by lots and lots of mammals. So rodents, deer, chipmunks, skunks, and your neighborhood cats. And so I swear there are squirrels that follow me around my landscape, notice where I plant things and then immediately dig them up. If that is the case, or you have any of these creatures that are either digging them up or eating them, uh, at the planting process, you could lay down some chicken wire or some fine mesh over the top. So you would plant the bulbs and then on top of the bare soil, you could add your chicken wire, your layer of chicken wire, and then mulch on top of that. So that would prevent any sort of digging. Uh, obviously squirrels and cats will not enjoy digging into chicken wire. Um, you could try some shells, you could try rocks, uh, that might help. There are plastic, um, I'm trying to think of how to describe this. There's like plastic mats that you can actually buy from some of the garden supply stores and they have like spikes of death that uh, stick upright. And so they are used in house plants, especially for cats that like to dig around plants or in raised beds, but you could lay those down and spikes of death, they're not going to injure the animal, but obviously it's not a good surface to, to use. I have heard people using like potpourri uh, because it's a little bit more coarse. I don't know how successful that is. It seems like maybe a wives tale, but do what you can to deter them. Um, if you have deer that browse, obviously tulips are like candy for deer, especially when they come up in the spring, rabbits as well. Uh, then you're looking to plant more of the animal resistant bulbs like daffodils, the fritillaria, and some of those others. That's where you do some research to find what is animal resistant and what would work in your garden. And if all else fails, you can always cage them off and try to protect them that way. Um, I do know that animals are a huge problem. Digging is a huge problem. And again, you might have the landscape where adding bulbs to the ground is just not a good solution. So you'll have to work with your local conditions. Hey, Allison, Other can I stop you real quick for a yeah. question? Um, this one just popped in from Christina. Um, do you take the chicken wire up in the spring before they bloom? You wouldn't need to. Uh, that's a great question. So the chicken wire, you know, the holes are usually two by two. Um, so that wouldn't be something that you would need to do because the bulbs will again find their way through the chicken wire. Um, but obviously having chicken wire long-term in the garden may not be a good solution. So 
Um, and really the, the problem is, is that once the bulbs go in, if they're not established, so once they form those roots and are more established, they're a lot harder to dig out. Um, but it's just those fresh bulbs when they're nice and loose and uh, that's when they tend to be more desirable. So. Okay, uh, other potential problems is that depending on where you plant them, you might have some heat reflection from your foundation of your house especially on the west or south side. So we have seen bulbs come up, at least the foliage might peek out of the ground even in January. And then people really get anxious because they know that things could get damaged. So on those warm days, you might start to see some growth. Uh, if that's the case, try to plant a little bit further away from the foundation or avoid those spaces completely. Uh, for the most part, you might get some damage to the leaves, so you might get some cold injury when they turn, it might turn brown, uh, but just because the leaves pop up doesn't mean that the flower is coming up immediately after. Usually the flower is delayed. Um, if this does happen and we get one of those really freakish cold snaps where your flowers are actually starting or more than likely we're going to get snow, you could then help cover those plants. So in this case, there's some um, pine straw mulch. You could use regular mulch. Actually, snow is better than just exposed cold temperatures because snow actually insulates the plants. And so you've probably seen where you might have daffodils in bloom. They get covered by snow, they get smushed. But then the next day when it's 60 degrees, they pop back up and everything is fine. Uh, but just know it's the, the bulb flower the buds themselves that can be damaged uh, with really cold weather. In the spring, uh, you can remove the flowers once they fade. You can prevent from seed formation. That's totally fine if you don't want these reseeding. Some people do, some people don't. But the important thing is that you really need to leave the leaves until they wither and brown or leave them in the ground for at least, at least six weeks. And this is where people become less enthralled with having bulbs because dead, mushy leaves on the ground that are kind of strewn across the surface are not very attractive and I totally get that. Uh, but what the reason you leave them is because those leaves are providing all of the carbohydrates and food for the bulb to then bloom in future years. So if you remove those leaves, there's no way that the bulb can provide the food for itself and keep on growing. So it is important. So really the rule of thumb is leave the leaves until they brown and until they easily pull out. Um, if you try to tug on them and you get some resistance, the leaves are not ready. So just leave them until the point where they are crunchy and brown and then you can remove them from the garden. Um, people sometimes do clever things by tying them up or making little bundles. You could do that. I've also heard that it's less efficient for photosynthesis because you reduce the leaf surface area. And so it can't photosynthesize if it's tied in a little knot. So anyway, it is important that you leave those leaves. I found this sign at the Chicago Botanic Gardens and I just loved it. So this just says that ornamental grasses are good companions to bulbs. They politely let the bulbs bloom first and then the ornamental grasses graciously grow to cover their friends foliage. So that is something, putting companion plants around the bulbs to kind of mask some of those things is, is a really great solution. Ground covers are also a nice thing where maybe they don't really get going until after the bulbs have blooming. Purchasing bulbs, let's talk about that. So bulb size is a good indicator for how many blooms you're going to get. Uh, so the bigger the bulb, the more blooms that you will likely have. So if you are hand picking them from your local garden center, select the largest bulbs that you can. And also know that the larger the bulb is, the higher the cost. So this is one of those giant alliums, and this will cost anywhere from $10 to $15, uh, which doesn't seem like a lot, but yet it seems like a lot because it's just a little bulb. Um, but do avoid any bulbs that are mushy, discolored, or have like any sort of signs of disease and things like that. Just don't even pick those. So this is where specialty bulbs, if you have specifics that you want to buy, specific colors, specific cultivars, that is where you can go online or you can also get them from a nursery or greenhouse. Um, if you plan to do things more in mass, you want to create your own um, 
Grape Hyacinth River in your backyard, then buying in bulk is going to be a lot less expensive. And usually for the most part, our garden centers, if you buy 10 or more or 50, there'll be a discounted rate. So the more you buy, generally the less expensive they'll be. Um, just know that individual bulb prices will vary. They can be anywhere from a quarter to $10 or more, just depending on what you want to buy. And again, the more you buy, the more you save. So consider that. When you are shopping, don't forget to tag or label your bag when you get home. Uh, this is especially important if you have colors in mind because all tulip bulbs are going to look the same, right? So all tulips will look the same. You don't know if it's pink or red or white or striped. Uh, so do label your bags. Um, if you like kind of a, you know, a mixed bag, you could throw all your tulips in together and plant them and, and go from there. You can mark where you plant your bulbs with golf tees, flags, or plant tags. That's a great option. Um, I have a nosy beagle and she loves to remove plant tags from the ground. So that was largely unsuccessful in my own garden. And for naturalized bulb plantings, if you want to do this look, you're going to plant about 20 small bulbs per square foot. So you're really packing them in there. Um, larger bulbs like the daffodils, uh, they can be planted more irregularly because they're going to be more of an impact on their own. All right, Amy, any questions before I get into types of bulbs? Nope, we are doing good. Okay. All right, so types of spring blooming bulbs. The first is alliums. And honestly, I feel I could do an entire presentation on alliums because they are amazing. They are in the onion family. So you'll notice an oniony odor uh, when you buy them. I just had some in my car last week and smelled oniony. So the flowers on the alliums are rounded and they can be up to 12 inches in diameter. Some of the giant alliums are absolutely incredible. Uh, the heights vary from three to four feet. You might get some shorter ones, but just know that they can be a taller plant. And if you are placing them in the landscape, you might want to put them further back from the edge. Um, all of the alliums are going to have a globe or a rounded type head. And for the most part, there's not a lot of leaves associated with the ornamental onions. They might have some basil leaves or grass-like foliage, uh, but the stalk where the flower arises from is not going to have any leaves on it. Um, comes in different colors, purple, blue, red, yellow, and white. Um, they have a very long bloom period. And what's nice about the alliums is when the flowers start to die down, the head of it usually remains intact. It becomes very ornamental in itself. So I have had alliums that have stayed in my garden until the stalk really withers and browns well into July or August. So the flower has faded and it's no longer colorful, but it turns this beautiful straw color. And then it just adds this really nice structure to the garden. For the most part, these are not going to be bulbs that are going to be bothered by animals because they have a funny smell. Um, Alliums can reseed. I've not found them to be invasive at all. And so I actually enjoy when they reseed and pop up in other parts of the garden. They're really nice cut or dried flower. And again, the blooms will add some nice winter interest. Couple that you can consider, Globemaster is one of the famous ones. You can see the small toddler in the picture and how big those flowers are. And um, some of the bigger alliums are going to be very expensive. So just keep that in mind. But I think well worth it because weeks of bloom um, and then nice features after the fact. If you like more of a free form, Molly might be a good one. It's a nice yellow color. And I just thought this was hilarious. This is one of the alliums that I had in my garden. And the way the sheath of the flower came off just reminded me of Pinocchio. So cute. So anyway, alliums can't tell a lie. It's true. Moving into crocus. Crocus is kind of the poster child of the spring bulb world along with tulips. But really to me, crocus are the first signs of spring. Uh, it is one that the squirrels absolutely love. So if you do have squirrel issues or uh, problems with digging, this is one that you would want to make sure that you're protecting. Um, it is a flatter corm, so you're going to plant them a little less shallow or a little more shallow in the ground. They don't need as deep of a hole. And crocus really come in most of those kind of 
fun muted colors of the purples, white, yellow. They have stripy ones, as you can see. Um, and they do have great grass-like foliage. So if you have converted or you have a warm season lawn like buffalo grass, blue grandma, uh, Bermuda grass, this is one that generally tends to naturalize in lawns because it blooms early. And then the foliage will dry down before your warm season grasses start to really grow. So it's kind of a nice feature. There's a lawn here in Windsor that has some crocus planted in it. And I just, I love how it looks. Uh, these do need full sun, well-drained soil, and saffron does come from the crocus. It is my understanding that those bulbs are not hardy to Colorado. You can get them, um, but they are not hardy. But if you want to grow them for saffron, you could. Pickwick is kind of a classic one. This is uh, purple stripy, uh, and this is a really good early pollinating flower. The bees always find the crocus, the honeybees, and it's a great source of nectar for some of the bees in the early spring. Yellow mammoth is another really common yellow cultivar that you could consider. One that you may not be familiar with is the crowned imperial. And this is one that is just such an interesting plant uh, because it's so tropical looking. So these are the bulbs. And I also like them because they have a slight skunky smell. So I am one of those weird ones when I smell skunk, I'm not totally offended by it. And believe me, this is not a strong skunk smell, but I always forget that I've planted it. And then I'll walk outside into the garden and, you know, do a sniff and it's like, where's that skunk? Oh, that's right. It's just the fritillaria. Um, so if you do have animal problems, fritillaria might be a good one to plant because for the most part, it's going to be left alone. The plant height reaches about 30 inches tall. The flowers are orange or yellow and they're bell shaped and they droop down. So um, it's called the crowned imperial. It is extremely cold hardy, um, but again, it looks so tropical and having it in the garden is I think a really special treat. Uh, one bulb can give you up to three flowers and it is one that tends to be more expensive. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but I've had one, I bought one, and it has bloomed reliably for at least the last five years. So that's a good thing. It does do better if it gets a little bit of afternoon shade, and it does prefer a little bit more of a, a rich, well-drained soil. So maybe an area that's been cultivated a little bit better in your garden, the fritillaria will do better. Now there's a cousin of the crown imperial that's called the checkered lily. And this one I believe to be just, just as spectacular, but it's a teeny tiny little bulb. Um, there, uh, thus, thus it has a little teeny tiny flower, but it's called the checkered lily. And you can see that it actually has a true checkered pattern on the petals itself. It's so interesting. Um, you really have to be down on the ground and low to enjoy it because you might miss it. But I just think it's so spectacular um, and such a cute little bulb in the landscape. Uh, so it only gets to be about nine to maybe 12 inches tall and it's going to bloom in mid spring. It does need regular moisture all year. So it would benefit from an area that might get overspray from your lawn or an area where it might get more regular drip irrigation. And because it's so diminutive, it really does need to be planted in mass. So one little checkered lily is, you're going to overlook it. You'll forget that it's there. It will get trampled by the dogs, uh, but if you plant them in mass, it will be far more impactful. So this is a better look of the checkered lily. And again, the, the petals themselves have this checkered pattern. Uh, it does bloom. I have it along the sidewalk, so I try not to miss it. But again, it's so not very noticeable that you do have to remember that you planted it and then look at it um, and really respect it in that sense. But definitely worth planting. It's a minor bulb and just the patterning on it is nothing else that we have in the garden. Another minor bulb is snowdrop. We'll also talk about snowflake in the next slide. And these are the ones that bloom the earliest. So we might actually see these bloom in January or February, depending on the season. And they are always white. Um, the snowdrop differs from the snowflake by having short segments on the flower and doesn't have green dots. 
That will make sense in a couple of slides when I show you what the snowflake looks like. Snowdrops are maybe six inches tall. They can naturalize and they do prefer more of a shady location. You do need a lot. So the bulbs themselves are maybe the size of a dime. Very, very, very small. So buy a lot in order to make an impact and put a whole bunch in the space to really get a nice patch of the snowdrops. And usually for the most part, rodents are going to leave this one alone. Another shot of the snowdrop, you can see how it has these three petals and then the center portion. Here's the snowflake and snowdrops and snowflakes could be planted together for a nice impact. Compared to the snowdrop, the snowflake does have these green tips on each of the petals themselves. Another one that blooms very, very early um, and all of the petals are the same length. So that's how they differ. I would really, you know, plant them together. They're going to be treated the same. They'll need the same cultural conditions, about the same size bulb, and they're just really cute. They're just so cute. So plant these with your checkered lily in a spot and just enjoy the show. It'd be amazing. Hyacinths are a wonderful fragrant blooming bulb. Uh, very, very sweet fragrance. Another wonderful pollinator plant in the early spring. And for the most part, it's interesting that if you look at the bulb of a hyacinth, that will usually tell you what color the flower is going to be. So if it's blue or purple, it's going to have a blue or purple flower. Uh, lots of variation in the flower colors. So purple, white, pink, blue, yellow, peach. Uh, the the plant height is 10 inches tall. And the blooms, the individual blooms have multiple flowers. And so each of these is a multiple flower and they do have an absolutely wonderful fragrance. So to really get the impact of hyacinth, you would want to plant them in groups together, probably three to five or even more to really get that nice impact. If you can have it below a window where the wind is going to waft and bring that smell inside, that's even better. It does like full sun. I will say that they're not a very reliable bloomer. So they will bloom reliably the year after you plant. So if you plant them this fall, they'll do great in 2022. And after that, they tend to get very, very spotty. Um, so just know that they're a great bulb. They have wonderful scent, uh, but they're not going to be a reliable bloomer like daffodils are year after year. Also try to buy the biggest bulbs that you can. That will mean that you have a better flower set. And if you have any sort of sensitivities to planting um, things or sensitivities to uh, plant material, I would wear gloves when you plant it because there is a component on these bulbs that might cause an irritation to your skin. So I would always recommend that you wear gloves uh, when you're dealing with hyacinth bulbs. One that I had to buy that I incorporated into the landscape is called Jan Boz. Uh, my mom's name is Jan, and we had a dog named Bosley growing up. So Jan Boz has a home in my garden. And the pink, this really is how pink it is. It's a beautiful magenta pink. Excellent. It's just awesome. So consider Jan Boz. Reticulated iris, uh, these are going to bloom earlier than your other iris. And these are again, would be considered a minor bulb about nine inches tall, but that blue with the yellow throats on them is just spectacular. They really make a landscape pop, especially if you put them in an area that might not get a lot of sun with more shade. That blue just really, really shines. Um, does prefer more well-drained soil. This is a great plant if you have a rock garden or a very sunny border, um, but can also go and transition into more of a shady spot. It is again one that would be best planted in mass and needs large numbers for a good display. So buy more than you think you need in order to have a good display. Daffodils, everyone's familiar with daffodils or narcissus, uh, daffodil hybrids are extremely common. This is a trumpet shaped flower. And these are ones that are excellent for naturalizing. So they do form larger clumps over time. Um, you can actually divide them if they've been in the landscape for a while. You dig up the whole clump, chunk them apart, and then replant them. In case you didn't know, there are actually 12 divisions or classes of daffodils that are all different and separated by the length of the trumpet. 
I will not get into that today, but just know that there's a lot of variation in daffodils and also a lot of variation in the colors. So yellow is the classic daffodil, but there are ones with bicolors. So the trumpet might be a different color than the actual corolla, which is the, the fan part around or behind the trumpet. Uh, daffodils are extremely versatile. They're super easy to grow and they will have again a long bloom period. So they can go from early spring to really mid spring. Um, so you can get several weeks of blooms with daffodils. The problem is, is that they do bloom early. So if we get one of those heavy wet snows, because they're taller, they tend to get squished. They do grow back upright, but they're never quite the same. They're always a little bit hunched over, uh, but still it's not a reason not to plant daffodils. I just absolutely love them. Plants can range from three inches to 20 inches tall. So lots of variation out there. And another one that would be good if you have any sort of mammal issues in your garden. Um, so just be aware of that. Dutch master uh, obviously comes from Holland and is one of the classic yellow uh, daffodils that we do see. Pink pride has again that pink trumpet with a white uh, Corolla, absolutely beautiful. Um, so there's a lot of really fun variation in the daffodils, also in tulips, also in hyacinths. So you can really jazz up your spring garden by picking different plants. Jetfire is a smaller one. So the two that I just showed were much larger, more showcase daffodils, while these are some of the smaller ones where you usually get more than one bloom per plant. So you might get multiple blooms that come up from a bulb. And tulips, uh, tulips are a classic spring plant, the number one most popular bulb, and I hate to say it, but probably treat it as an annual in Colorado. It is not one that will faithfully bloom each year. It will not bloom every year like your uh, daffodils do. Um, tulips, I moved into my house and lived here for several years, and then all of a sudden these red tulips appeared. I hadn't planted them, so clearly the previous homeowner had. Uh, so it was kind of a special treat, but also unusual. So that is how tulips are. They're just a little bit finicky and they won't bloom for you every year. So if tulips are something that you want to see every spring, I would encourage you to plant them every fall. Uh, the height can be up to 36 inches tall, uh, wide basil leaves. And if you have deer or rabbits, they will be munched on. Uh, for sure. Tulips are exceptionally delicious to those animals for some reason. Uh, what's nice though about tulips is that you can really select plants that will bloom early, mid, and late season. So you could have a long display of tulips in the garden if conditions are right. There is one that's a true black, which is outstanding. I love black plants. And if you pair them with white ones, it's just that black and white display is spectacular. There's also that black petunia. Um, but there's been so much hybridization gone, that has gone into tulips that we have all of these amazing color combinations. And Queen of Night really is a, a true black. So that's a fun one that you could pair then with some other white flowers, maybe some white daffodils. That'd be absolutely beautiful. Uh, apricot parrot. So the parrot tulips are extremely showy. Uh, they have a lot of variation in their coloring. Um, they're also highly desired. And so you could pay big bucks for some of these really specialty bulbs. Uh, but this is a great one. Obviously, a lot of show would be with this with this tulip. Uh, Shirley Double is a double flowered one. Uh, you can see it's just gorgeous. I love tulips. I just, I absolutely love them even though they're unreliable. I just, I love them. They're great. And I think I end with squill. So squill is clusters of blue bell-shaped flowers. Uh, the petals reflex out. They're very, very hardy, very tolerant. They're only six to 12 inches tall, but they naturalize. And so they are absolutely spectacular. I got my undergraduate degree at Iowa State and in all of their forested areas, they have squill that has naturalized and it is such a spectacular show. If you're in Ames in April, uh, stop by. It is absolutely beautiful and they're a perfect woodland plant so they can tolerate some shade. Um, and again, they're going to grow, uh, but to start things off, you do want to plant several together. 
Uh, so to wrap it up, try to get your bulbs in the ground before the end of the month. Uh, water following planting and then cover with mulch. If you have rodent issues, maybe use some chicken wire, things like that. Um, Amy in the chat is going to put in uh, the fact sheet on growing bulbs indoors. If you want to start tulips or daffodils and give them away, uh, that's a really good comprehensive fact sheet that explains the process. It's a whole other talk and really have fun. That's the biggest thing is, you know, this is great. The best part is that you'll usually plant these in the fall, completely forget about it until you start seeing the blooms in the spring.